Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the American Psychological Association Division 46, the Society for Media Psychology and Technology Research Webinar Series. I'm Jerry Lynn Hogg and the 2015 president of Division 46. And it's, uh, uh, I'm glad to welcome Chris Ferguson, Dr. Chris Ferguson today to speak to us. He'll be speaking to us about effectively communicating with new media after tragic events, the case of mass homicides. Chris Ferguson is the department chair and the associate professor of psychology at Stetson's University. He also has the great uh, distinction of being awarded the uh, APA Division 46 Early Career Professional Contribution Award and also holds fellowship fellowship status in Division 46, as well as another division. Chris, what's the other division? Uh, division one, which is general psychology. Division one, great. So uh, Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. I do ask that everybody go ahead and mute yourself if you're not speaking, so we can try to minimize background. We'll then open it up to question and answer and discussion after Chris's uh, presentation, so great. Chris, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the uh, the introduction. Um, as, as Jerry Lynn said, I'm, I'm Chris Ferguson, and uh, I teach over here at Stetson University, which is in uh, Central Florida, it's right near Orlando. Uh, so it's a pretty nice area um, uh, to be in. And and today, what I'm, I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit about the, the way that we can communicate with news media following uh, tragic events. Uh, it's been sort of a, an interest of mine. I do a lot of research on response to mass shootings and, and, and those types of events. Um, so it's kind of interesting to me the way that um, news media transmits information, the way that law enforcement or, or policymakers communicate with news media, and the way that uh, scholars communicate with media. Um, so I'm always kind of interested in how these things all kind of influence each other uh, when these types of, uh, of events happen. And I'm and I focus in on mass homicides because I do a little bit of work with mass homicides, although uh, this general issue can apply to a lot of other types of tragedies uh, or tragic events or emotional events uh, as well. So so hopefully I'll, I'll probably talk for about uh, 20 to 25 minutes or thereabouts and then open things up for any, any questions. Um, that people may have, and hopefully everybody can see uh, the slides that are on my screen. Um, I am sort of moving forward as if people can, but um, just, just a little bit about myself. I, I have a PhD in clinical psychology and it's from the University of Central Florida, and I got it about 11 years ago. Um, now I actually got my bachelor's degree right here from Stetson, so I've, I've been kind of rooted to Central Florida uh, for quite some time now. I can consider this area home uh, for the most part. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned, I, I actually, actually started doing research on violent behavior. That was actually my initial area of interest. And um, my dissertation was on inmates in Central Florida. And, uh, and, I, and I kind of got interested in media effects, like the violent video game stuff, in, in large part in response to public comments that were being made about media following the Columbine massacre in 1999 and, uh, and similar, sorts of, uh, similar sorts of events. And I was really, really interested in a way that, uh, you know, journalists and, and policymakers were communicating the idea of media effects, um, but also the way that some scholars were communicating the idea of media effects too. And so that was, that was a time period where people were very, clearly trying to link video game violence to mass shooting events and you hear the idea that the effects were as strong as smoking on lung cancer and things like that. Um, so I was kind of interested in, in, in sort of like the social construction of all of this. How, how does this sort of narrative develop um, and what does that have on things like public policy and science policy and, and um, scientific findings and, uh, and things like that. So how do all these things interact with each other, journalists, policymakers, and, um, and, and, and scientists. Um, other things about me, just in case you're curious, uh, I, do, I do have a novel out, Suicide Kings, it's available on Amazon. Uh, I, I do write uh, fiction, actually probably my first love. Uh, I've, I've had some short stories published and you can find links to them on, on my webpage. Um, I live in Orlando with my wife and son, uh, actually just right outside Orlando. And other things, I like The Walking Dead and Doctor Who. If you're if you're not aware, that blue box at the bottom right is a what's called a TARDIS. And if you're a Doctor Who fan, you know what that means. If you 
uh, are not a Doctor Who fan, that means nothing at all. Um, so uh, I, I do tend to be a, sort of a, a mid-level geek, I guess. You can probably see the, uh, I can point to right here, the poster of X-Files over my left shoulder as well. So I'm a big fan of the X-Files. Um, so those are the kind of things that um, interest me outside of doing this uh, psychology research stuff. But anyway, so so to get into this, you know, when we think about tragic events, um, and again, I'm going to focus in on uh, mass shootings, but these things uh, apply to uh, a, lar a large array of, of, of frightening events. And I have the picture here of the Malaysian airline. I don't think that's the exact plane, but uh, there, of course, was the Malaysian Airlines that went missing. Uh, they now think they found some pieces of it, um, but uh, I think it was two years ago, went missing. Um, and after that, there was, you know, obviously nobody knew what happened, really, you know, to the plane, other than it was gone. Uh, and there was uh, lots of speculation that filled in that gap of, of lack of knowledge. So some people were saying, well, maybe terrorists had kidnapped the plane and flew it to Central Asia, and they actually had kidnapped all the passengers. Some people were talking about maybe the pilots had committed suicide or there were terrorists on board. And the reality is nobody knew really what, what um, happened to the plane. And we really still don't know what happened to the plane, even though uh, they think they have found some pieces of it. Um, so... Uh, yeah, you know, I was sort of curious about the way that all this sort of information flooded into that vacuum. So there was there was a really a lack of good concrete information, but that didn't stop you know the news media from covering it. You know, pretty much twenty four hours a day, seven days a week for a while there, and there was lots of um, you know experts who were, were asked to comment on what may have happened, what the most likely scenario was, and I think that. Even one of the news channels got into some trouble uh, because I kept doing these reenactments with with some uh, pilot um, that were, were were pretty bogus uh, for the most part. So uh, there there really was um, a, a lot of attempt to 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 flood people with information, even though the quality of that information may not have always been um, been very good. And part of this is what I have here in the, on the second bullet point is there sometimes is a, is a pretty huge gap between what people need to know, at least what they perceive themselves as needing to know, and what actually is known. So when a tragic event happens, uh, whether it's an airplane crash, whether it's a mass shooting event, whether it's related to a disease, or like uh, I was thinking about, I think it was a year ago, the big Ebola crisis where people were panicking about Ebola coming to the U.S. and such. Um, people feel the need that they, they, they want to know uh, what is causing it, what they should do, what the risks are of this thing happening in the future. So the people who you know, are the experts, if you will, really don't know, and, and there's no information uh, to be had. So I, I think this causes a certain degree of tension uh, for news media where they need to put some information into that vacuum to try to keep people watching or happy or however you want to um, think of it. So the, the consequence of this, I talk about this with journalists all the time when, when mass shootings happen, is when traumatic events happen, the initial batch of information we have from them is oftentimes very, very unreliable. Uh, you know, people say this happened for this reason or whatever, and oftentimes those initial reports can be very, very um, you know, inaccurate. Um, so, and, and some of the things I have, as I mentioned here, some things to watch out for. Anonymous sources, for instance, tend to be terrible. Um, uh, they can say anything without really being accountable. And so you know, basing information on anonymous sources oftentimes is, is quite unreliable. Uh, these, news these news channels now aren't just transmitting news for you know, an hour a night, but they have to fill up 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I think there have even been a few studies that have suggested that, that have looked at sort of like the content of news media. So looking at like CNN or Fox News or things like that um, and found that something like 90 percent of the time is filled with opinion. So they just get talking heads to go on these uh, news channels and talk about events, but kind of speculate about what might have happened or what should happen in the future in terms of policy uh, or things like that. So only something around like 10 percent of information on, on news media anymore is actually news. You know, it's actually information that uh, means anything. A lot of it now is simply people talking about their uh, their opinions. Um, some of you may be familiar with the concept of clickbait. Um, so, uh, or if you haven't uh, heard of that, you may be familiar with the concept of if it bleeds, it leads. Kind of a similar idea that um, we have to remember that news media um, are are trying to sell something. I mean, they're dependent upon advertising. Um, 
funding, just like most media is. And so that means they need subscribers, they need uh, people to watch, they need people to click on links, that's the clickbait uh, aspect of things. Uh, so there is an incentive, and we'll get back to this idea, there's an incentive for news media to have dramatic headlines that are very conclusive and to avoid more temperate news headlines that are less conclusive. So, uh, you know, saying something that's sort of wishy-washy isn't gonna get a lot of people attention. Saying, you know, uh, violent video games, we're not really sure if they do anything. This isn't really a great headline. You know, violent video games damaging the brains of your kids is an excellent headline. Uh, and it's going to get a lot more attention, a lot more clicks through, um, a lot more subscribers and, and things like that. People are going to watch, even if they disagree with it. Uh, people are going to be attracted to those types of, 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 of headlines. Um, I don't know if any of, you, any of you have backgrounds in journalism, but my observation is that it seems like there's a lot less fact checking um, in news media uh, in recent years, even with a lot of science. Um, so sometimes I call this uh, death by press release um, that, um, you know, I've observed a lot of and coming up from psychological science, certainly, but other fields as well, that oftentimes the press releases don't really reflect the actual study very well um, and maybe exaggerate the findings of the study or exaggerate how generalizable they are um, or how what the quality of them is. And, and news media are not always great, um, perhaps less so than they were in years past, of getting other scholars to, to weigh in with their opinions, making sure the information is reliable. So sometimes you have to be careful of articles that are just kind of regurgitations of a press release um, that are in some ways more propaganda than they are necessarily um, you know, realistic. So, so again, I, I think a lot of this comes into the, this issue that news media feel a vacuum of solid information, but because they need to fill it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they need to fill it with something. Um, and they oftentimes will turn to less reliable pieces of information in order to fill up um, that uh, news cycle. I should say, by the way, if anybody wants to interrupt and ask a question, please feel free to do so. Um, I obviously can babble on pretty good, um, but, um, but, but please feel free to interrupt me if you, if you do want to do so. And, and, and Challenge me or ask a question or whatever you'd like to do. Um, so now the, the example of mass shootings, of course, is where I spend most of my time uh, thinking about uh, this stuff. So obviously mass shootings are incredibly traumatic events uh, for us as individuals and as a society. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about the Sandy Hook shooting in 2012 where Adam Lanza, 20-year-old male, uh, killed, oh, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, I think somewhere around 20 uh, elementary school children and I think six adults uh, and then also his mother. Um, and, and I remember the day after that happened, and I have a 12-year-old son myself. He was probably about 10, I think, at the time, 9 or 10, somewhere in that range. And uh, I remember sending him to school the next day, and just like, what a surreal and depressing and anxiety-provoking experience that was in the sense of, you know, as parents, we expect to send our kids to school and get them back uh, at the end of the day. And just the idea that, you know, my child's life could be snuffed out um, during the course of that day, with me having no awareness or control over that, it was, it was just incredibly threatening. Um, so, I mean, it, you can see, I, I think, or you can understand how people in society react to these type of events, um, as rare as they are, and it is important to point out that as much press as they get, mass shootings remain incredibly rare, even though it doesn't always seem like it. Um, but they're traumatic in, in, in some ways, I, I think, similar to airplane crashes or the idea that Ebola could um, come raging through our populace because it appears like, like a lightning bolt from the sky. I mean, it's, 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 sort of, it's occurring in public spaces that we're all occupying. So these are events that are occurring in malls or schools or places of business, um, theaters in some places of worship um, and such. Uh, so these are places we all occupy, or most of us occupy, um, you know, during the courses of our lives. And it seems like a lot of these events are really quite random. Um, so that makes them very threatening and emotional for us. So the idea that we or people that we love can go to these public places and be killed for no good reason whatsoever um, by someone who may be enraged or have a mental illness or, 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 or whatever else. Um, and so I think that makes these types of events, you know, very, very newsworthy um, and very, very emotional. It different from, and I, I have the example here, and I think that's different from something like gang violence. Now, gang violence is something that we all, again, are probably concerned about. We'd like to see less of it and so on and so forth. But, you know, if you live in a nice neighborhood, the, the you have this perception, at least, that the odds of you being a victim of gang violence is probably pretty low. Um, where that, um, you know, for mass shooting events, uh, they seem to occur almost in any neighborhood. Um, 
So that may make it such that we're less threatened as individuals by things like gang violence, unless we live in a city or a neighborhood where, where gang violence is a problem. Um, but, they, but, but initially gang violence may get a little bit less attention than, than, than mass shooting events. So one of the issues about mass shootings is that there is no real standardized definition of what a mass shooting event is um, to begin with. Um, so most criminologists kind of say it's a shooting that involves three or more deceased victims, not including the shooter, him or herself. Usually himself. There, there are a few female mass shooters, but not very many. Um, but, but from that, exactly which cases are included in this concept of mass shooting differs over time. Um, so, for instance, should we include gang violence in with mass shootings if three or more people are killed? Um, in the past, historically, people haven't. Um, now, maybe people are shifting into a direction of including more of those uh, instances. Um, if we have a parent who kills his children and wife, uh, for instance, and there are three, three victims, is that, is that included as a mass shooting? Or are we only including... Um, uh, stranger on stranger violence, you know, the things that are occurring in churches or religious places or theaters or malls or, or, or things like that. So and this is this idea of what's called the social construction of crime, that, that some of these criminal events have a certain fluidity in their definition, um, which once we as a society start to glom onto something like this as an issue, we start to look for more and more cases to fit into that narrative. So right now we're really, really focusing on mass shootings. And uh, as a consequence, I think we're looking for more and more examples that fit into mass shootings um, that in the past we wouldn't have thought of as being mass shootings. They would have been gang violence or family violence or things like that, still tragic events, um, but we wouldn't have put them into this heading of, of mass shooting events, which is important because that can inform that can influence things like our perception of how frequent these events are occurring. If mass media, news media, knows that it's going to get attention by highlighting mass shootings, news media is going to look for more and more cases uh, that are going to that they're going to be able to fit into uh, this particular heading. So that that brings us to this question of of you know are mass shooting events increasing or not? So we very many of us have this perception that that mass shooting events are um, increasing. Um, but we don't know that for sure. Um, and the, the alternate hypothesis is simply that uh, news media is paying more and more attention to these uh, types of events. That's giving us the perception of these events occurring more uh, frequently than they are. An excellent example of that is bullying. Uh, so there's a lot of news attention to bullying uh, and cyberbullying uh, right now. But most statistics suggest that bullying has actually been going down over the last decade, at least, which is about when they started uh, collecting information uh, about that. So news media attention can um, influence our perceptions of frequency. So a lot of people think that bullying is worse than it ever has been among kids today, uh, but in reality it isn't. Uh, and in fact, it's been going down at least as far as people have been keeping records on that. And that's only been for about 10 years uh, in fairness. And, and the same thing is kind of occurring with mass shooting events and that there's a lot of debate about whether these mass shooting events are actually increasing or have been holding steady or may even been decreasing um, over time. And, and I'm not taking a, a strong stance on any of those, but uh, there certainly is a, um, a debate. Uh, James Fox, and I have a citation here, who's probably one of the foremost criminologists that studied this issue, uh, argues that, that, that mass shooting events really have been staying stable since the, uh, the 1990s in terms of raw numbers. And, uh, and that it's really that news media is paying much more attention um, rather than these events are actually occurring more often than they are. And a couple other things that you know, kind of throw in there um, are that we really don't have any um, analyses that look at per capita uh, analyses of mass murder trends. So we tend to focus on a raw numbers, you know, how many mass shooting events have been occurring just in general. But we haven't adjusted those numbers for our expanding population. Um, and we're now at something like 300 um, you know, plus million people in the U.S., um, we don't know if you adjust for the per capita increase in the population if mass shooting events are increasing or decreasing or staying stable. And that also you know, occurs for cross-national comparisons. Now, most people will agree that probably the U.S. has more mass shooting events than other industrialized nations do, at least. But, um, but keep in mind, if you do like a comparison versus the U.S. versus, say, Germany, um, you know, Germany has had some mass shooting events, uh, but certainly uh, fewer than, than we have. 
But on the other hand, they also have one fifth the population that we do. So if, if the U.S. has more mass shooting events, how much of that is due to a true increase in gun violence compared to Germany, which probably does exist. Um, but how much of that also is due to population differences? And you have to kind of keep some of that stuff in mind um, as well. Um, one of the controversies were over the FBI in 2014 did release a report suggesting that what they called active shooters, um, which are not all mass murderers, uh, by the way, but just anybody that happened to have a gun, you know, uh, reported on, um, you know, in public somewhere, uh, that these events had been increasing. Um, but they were criticized for that because they relied to a great degree on news media. Um, so again, we get back to the social construction of crime. So they looked uh, in the past for news media coverage of mass shooting events or, or active shooter events, excuse me. Um, uh, but there again, I mean, you're, a lot, you're using the assumption that mass media or news media has covered this issue consistently the same across several decades, which we, we know is probably not likely to be uh, uh, the case. So they, they got a, a lot of criticism for um, for that particular report. So they, they, the answer is we don't, we don't know if, if mass shooting events are increasing or decreasing or staying stable. Um, my suspicion is that they're probably pretty stable at a very, very low rate of occurrence. Um, but, but without better statistics, we don't really know that. Um, so anyway, some of you may remember the Sandy Hook shooting that occurred in December 2012, which I just told you a little bit about. Um, if, if you were aware of the concept of a moral panic, and I'll talk in another slide about what a moral panic is, if you, you sort of had an idea of what that term meant, watching the, the country's reaction to Sandy Hook was a great example of being able to watch a moral panic in, in progress. Um, because in some ways, the, the Connecticut State Police who were investigating uh, the shooting did, every, did a lot of things right. Um, and, and one of the things they did is really kind of shut down their interactions with news media until they released their official investigation report. So unlike a lot of law enforcement, the Connecticut State Police did not speculate about motive. They did not speculate about, you know, um, why the shooter may have done what he did. They, they, they really were not part of speculating about his, um, you know, alleged autism spectrum disorder and things like that. Uh, they really said, you know, we're not really going to say much of anything other than, you know, the, the facts of the case until the investigation has run its course. And good for them for doing that. Um, the downside is it took them 11 months uh, to do their investigation report. So there was really nothing official um, that came out of the Connecticut State uh, investigation until 11 months after the shooting had occurred. And that um, opened up a huge vacuum uh, for people to insert. Uh, everybody from knuckleheads on the street to scholars to activists for various causes to another, all the way up to the, the, the you know, Congress and the Office of the Presidency, all were involved in speculating about one thing or another or tying that shooting to a particular agenda or cause uh, and such. And that's because it was this huge information vacuum that was created by the Connecticut State Police, in some respects, doing probably what they should have done, which is to say nothing, uh, until until they had run the course of their investigation. So there was a lot of talk about you know the possibility of you know Adam Lanza having an autism spectrum disorder, um, which you know as psychologists we know that autism spectrum disorder is not really tied to violence, uh, but that didn't stop people from speculating about that quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot more talk about mental illness in general. Uh, certainly a lot of talk about gun violence, but also we saw you know, so some degree of talk about video game violence uh, um, and the potential impact, because the shooter was a 20-year-old guy, and most 20-year-old guys play violent video games. Um, so people speculated about that. Politicians were, call, were calling for quote-unquote studies of video game violence. Um, we had scholars that were in news media linking video game violence to mass shooting events and other acts. Of, of, of violence in society. Um, so there's a lot of speculation about this and, and that speculation occur without anybody knowing anything about how much Adam Lanza actually played video games. Um, there, there were reports that again were anonymous sources. So the language that got used quite a bit where there's an anonymous source close to the investigation. So there were a number of these sources that talked about that Adam Lanza played thousands and thousands of, all, of hours of Call of Duty online. Uh, there, there was one source at one point that talked about the idea that he swapped mags from, I'm, I'm making the motion like you can see, I know you can't, but the idea that he could swap mags from his gun uh, when they were half full and then put in a new mag, which is something that commonly players of uh, shooter games do when they go into a new room, for instance. It's just, it's just easier to do it that way. So the idea was that he was mimicking this sort of common action in first-person shooter games when he was going to an elementary school 
um, shooting real people in, um, in, in real life. And, um, and, and there was a lot of politics that were involved in that. I mean, you know, certainly the NRA held the press release, the National Rifle Association held a press relief, release um, or, or press conference, excuse me, um, where they very deliberately tr and successfully tried to shift a lot of the discussion from gun control onto video games. And they very clearly said it's not real guns, it's imaginary guns. Um, that's uh, you know creating gun violence uh, in society, but uh, but you know in, in fairness, even you know organizations like the APA got involved, and 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 I was part of a um, big meeting at the Institutes of Medicine after Sandy Hook, where you know I mean it's just, it's just my perception, but um, members of the APA uh, were running around trying to find ways to make the APA important, you know, um, after the shooting had occurred, and it felt. You know, again, just one person's opinion felt a little icky, you know, uh, and they weren't the only ones doing it. In fairness, this was nothing unique to the APA, but the, a lot of these groups were running around um, af after the shooting trying to, you know, it, 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 it sort of felt like people were throwing money around and, and everybody was diving for it uh, a little bit. Um, so, so there certainly were, were a lot of politics that, that got involved um, after the shooting. And, and, um, and it turned out in the, in the official investigation report, which didn't come out for 11 months, unfortunately, um, that um, that Lanza appeared not to play very many violent video games. He he had some in his house, uh, but most of them are quite old, uh, so they were not current. Um, and the the official investigation report found that the only games that he played re regularly were, were Dance Dance Revolution, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. And then the other one I think was one one of the Super Mario games. Um, he was he, he was apparently a fan of. Um, and, and, this, and the state of Connecticut even released a lot of sort of like the individual reports that police officers themselves are filling out. Um, and there were even comments by some of these police officers when they were speaking to victims or the, or the families of victims, they were even saying to, you know, sort of ignore the news media because there were all these kind of fraud hypotheses that were being, um, you know, thrown around in, in the news media about, not, not just about video games, but, but certainly including the video game stuff. Uh, and I, I've always wondered since then, like, who the hell were these anonymous sources that were close to the investigation that supposedly they had, um, you know, some of these journalists had, because they obviously knew nothing about the investigation. The, 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 the official report and even the individual paperwork of, of the different officers were, were in no way reflective of um, these uh, anonymous sources and what they were saying. And there's no mention of half-filled magazines or anything of that nature in the in, in the in the the official investigation report. So, and, and you know, in some ways this is sort of disturbing, I guess, but it's also so fascinating in many respects about just to watch how this occurred and see what the end result of it was and, and wonder how could we do this better? I mean, how can we stop this from happening um, in the future? Because the argument is that a certain percentage of the discussion was focusing on video games and in the end it really wasn't worth it. Um, and so how much of the oxygen did that take out of the room for other issues that perhaps we should have spent more time talking about um, than, than we did. So anyway, more panic theory. I'm just going to cover this really, really briefly. Uh, but if you're not familiar with it, uh, this is actually a diagram that Andy Shabilsky put together. So I can't claim credit for this diagram. I don't have artistic skills enough to do something like this. Uh, so he did a really good job with this. But the, the, the basic idea behind moral panic theory is that um, moral panics start with a society making a decision about something. And that can be that uh, terrorists are going to crash my plane or video games cause mass shootings or that Ebola is going to come across uh, to the U.S. and infect me and my family. So um, society starts with the belief and then incentivizes everybody else to support that belief. So politicians get incentivized uh, to you know, make dramatic claims about uh, Ebola uh, or terrorism or video games or whatever that particular panic may be. Um, news media, of course, because that's what's going to be what people watch. And then scholars as well, because that's where the grant money is going to be, or where they're going to get newspaper coverage, or where they're going to get prestige, you know, from their professional societies and such. Um, so society kind of creates this incentive system to fuel the panic, at least initially, um, until um, in some cases, basically until generations change. I mean, it, kind of, it sounds blunt, but you, for an issue like video games, you just kind of have to wait for the old folks to die. Um, and then what happens is then the people that are perhaps my, in my generation age into the power structure and we grew up with video games, so we're, we're less worried about them. But, but then we worry about whatever comes next, whether it's holograms or implanted technology into our brains or whatever, whatever the hell they're going to come up with in, in, in future decades. But that's kind of how moral panics, uh, you know, tend to, uh, you know, work. Um, 
and, 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 and certain of these things can tap into, like mass shootings, can tap into debates that we're already having. Um, so, of course, we're having a big national debate, if you, if you can call it that, about gun violence, a big argument, really, uh, about gun violence and gun control. And so people are very polarized on this issue of gun control. So there's this perception that when mass shooting events happen, that, that these mass shooting events can can be used politically to advance one side or another of those debates. So you have some people saying, look, a mass shooting occurs, so we really need to eliminate guns from society. And other people turn around and say, no, 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 we need to give everybody a gun, you know, so they can defend themselves when these things occur. Uh, but in, in both cases, the, you know, the different sides are using a traumatic event to advance um, a pre-existing policy goal um, that they have. And, and right now, mass shootings are tapping in very nicely to that discussion that we're having about gun violence and such. So uh, back in the 70s, people were, weren't really paying attention to mass shootings. They're they paying attention to serial murder. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with our national discussions in the 70s and 80s about pornography. So, so serial murder, there was a perception that, you know, serial murder was a sex crime. And oftentimes, but not always, it is. Um, and we had all these superstar serial killers like Ted Bundy and Jane, uh, John Wayne Gacy. Um, Jeffrey Dahmer and such that people are paying a, a lot of attention to. And then, you know, sort of briefly what, what kind of happened is in, by the 90s, uh, everybody just kind of get used to porn, uh, or most people did. And, you know, porn was released on the internet and you could get incredibly easy access to it. Um, I sometimes refer to that as the golden age of porn because it was just so widely available. Um, and, um, and, and, like, you know, society didn't end, you know, just the, the world just kind of continued on and, and most people just kind of saw that and may not be crazy about pornography, but um, sort of understood that it wasn't the sort of, you know, world shattering event to, to have access to that. And, and after that point, people kind of stopped paying attention to serial murder. Um, and, you know, if you think about, at least my perception is the last real superstar serial murder was Jeffrey Dahmer, which is about 1991, 1992. Um, and if you kind of think about, you know, what's that about, you know, 14, or excuse me, um, 24 years have since elapsed since then. Um, and can you name any famous serial murderers since Jeffrey Dahmer? You know, they're just, they're just kind of gone. I mean, and it's not because serial murder has stopped happening. It, it still happens in about the same frequency as it did in the 70s and 80s. Um, it's just that it lost its connection with a, a, a social narrative uh, that people were, uh, you know, were talking about. I have a couple other, you know, examples of these kind of moral panics that were tapped into social issues. So there were, there was satanic ritual abuse in the late 80s and early 90s, the idea that people were kidnapping babies and sacrificing them to Satan. That was a thing um, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, juvenile super predators, the idea that you know kids are getting worse and worse and going to become monsters and such, never materialized. Um, some people may have heard of the knockout game. This is the idea that teenagers are hitting random people to score points. Um, and it's, it's more of an invention of news media than a real thing. Um, and then sort of getting out of the violence, I mentioned rainbow sex parties. Uh, again, this, this ended up showing up on Oprah back in the 90s and became a thing for a while. It was the idea that teenagers were having parties where the girls would all wear different shades of lipstick and give oral sex to the boys, and the boys would collect the, the lipstick rings. That's, that's your rainbow, basically. Um, you know, did that ever happen somewhere someplace? Maybe, but there, there never were any established cases of it actually happening. Um, and so it was just really kind of this, this idea that teens are just getting worse and worse all the time. And that's very, very common to see a lot of these moral panics focusing on the idea that teenagers are terrible people. Um, and, and, uh, and here a lot of like law enforcement officers tend to be particularly guilty of saying things like, you know, teens today are doing these things younger and younger. Uh, and I've been hearing that all my life. I'm 44 now. And, and so if that was true, uh, kid, babies ought to be popping out of the uterus at this point with a gun in one hand and a cigarette in the other. But, you know, so... Um, there's just kind of these, these, these popular talking points that, you know, people, people make when they're, you know, trying to promote a particular agenda, particularly an anti-youth agenda, which is, which is fairly common. Um, and then, of course, you know, once, you know, um, this kind of narrative sets in, then we look for cases. We get confirmation bias, which I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with. Um, so one thing you may not be aware of with mass shooters, the, the average age of a mass shooter is somewhere around 40. Uh, and the age range is anywhere from, you know, 13 to 80. You know, so you get, you get mass shooters of all ages. Uh, but with the video game issue, what we tend to do is we focus in on cases like Adam Lanza, where we think, oh, this is a 20-year-old guy. Um, so he probably played violent video games. So then we all talk about violent video games. 
But when you have a case like William Spangler, who was like 62 or something like that, when he killed a bunch of people in New York, he killed a couple of firefighters, um, nobody mentions video games. Uh, so the, the, the issue just isn't raised at all. And that's that confirmation bias you can see with um, a lot of these, uh, you know, moral panics and such. So a couple things to keep in mind here is that, you know, responding to single tragic events is not a great idea because we get, we get incredibly emotional in response uh, to these tragic events. And that's not a great time to start talking about policy or making policy changes because those policy changes are probably going to be pretty bad um, and potentially do more damage uh, than, than, than they will uh, do any good. Um, there's also this idea of parasitic policy. So that's what I was kind of talking about with the gun control issue and, and such uh, that people will sometimes latch on to. And, I, and I'm, I don't, I'm not taking a position on gun control one way or the other, by the way. Um, but people will sometimes latch on to tragic events in order to promote their pre-existing agendas, which may be in good faith that may be perfectly reasonable agendas. Um, but sometimes people will tend to try to highlight a massive news event in order to promote it. And, and, and that's not, you know, I, I get why people do it, but it's, it's not going to be a great way to foster either a rational discussion about that policy um, um, or to, to, to see a kind of a policy change that's going to be very uh, effective or rational because people are just going to be too, uh, you know, too emotional. Um, and as, as I point out, um, you know, professional advocacy organizations, sometimes I refer to them as guilds, and, and sometimes I think it's better to think of groups like the APA as guilds uh, rather than scientific organizations, but they can, you know, jump into these uh, issues as well because they have their own agenda which is what they're there for. Um, you know, we pay as members money to the APA to promote us. Um, and, uh, you know, so they're doing their job. But, but I think we sometimes have to be realistic about their, their, their perspective and, and why they're doing, um, you know, these sorts of things. So, so some of you may be aware that the APA just, just released a, a, a task force report on video game violence, um, which in fairness, uh, they actually did kind of de-emphasize the idea that video game violence contributes to violence in society, but, but they still made a lot of connections with lesser acts of aggression. But it was an incredibly controversial task force, an incredibly controversial report, still very, very, um, you know, uh, controversial on some of its conclusions. And, and again, I think we have to take some of these things with a grain of salt in remembering that these types of organizations serve an important purpose. Um, but at, at, at the same time do have their agendas and these, and these types of statements they may make about science policy may not always reflect absolute truths or objective truths but policies that are advantageous to the APA uh, or the professional psychology or, or, or whatever else so in other words maybe to put it more bluntly stuff that's going to get us grants and newspaper headlines and prestige and, and, and things like that um, and there's a few you can uh, there, source may be. So, so this idea of media first responders, really Mary Gregerson des deserves the credit, uh, you know, for this concept. It really is, is, is her idea. And it's the idea that psychologists such as ourselves, media psychologists, really can function as um, consultants for news media to help them uh, discuss how to cover traumatic events in a way that is helpful rather than a way that is not helpful. So there's a lot of damage that can be done by bad coverage of, of traumatic events. And that's you know, everything from reinforcing very, very poor emotional policy decisions. You're giving people misinformation. Um, it, can traumatic, it, it can traumatize the families of, of the victims of the traumatic event um, as well. Um, so these are things we want to think about, that bad information can do a lot of harm um, and such. So, I mean, some of the things I think that media first responders can be helpful for, you know, and this is not by any means an inclusive list, but that includes reminding um, journalists that after a traumatic event happens that people are incredibly emotional and that includes law enforcement officers that includes scholars that includes policymakers and the sorts of things they're going to say are going to reflect that emotionality um, uh, people that are in these types of positions are also going to feel a lot of pressure to have answers and so they may say things that are much more conclusive than they should because of that pressure uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to have answers. So that gets to my second point there that people think, say, and do dumb things um, when they're emotional. We all have these experiences. If you can kind of think back to the last time you were feeling incredibly emotional about something, um, you can probably understand that your, your ability to make rational, good decisions was impaired um, to some point, some, to some extent. Some people even say that if you're feeling incredibly emotional about something, you shouldn't drive. Uh, 
uh, because your ability to respond to events occurring in your visual field are about as good as a drunk person um, you know, can do. So uh, initial information right after the disaster or traumatic event, again, is incredibly unreliable. And it's usually important if you can to remind news media about this. Um, and usually they're pretty good about understanding that that's the case if, if you do that. Um, you can help news media try to sort through what types of information is, is helpful and what is not. With, with mass shooting events, for instance, a lot of talk right now about should mass, should news media release the names of the perpetrators? You know, are, are we glamorizing mass, uh, you know, murder by releasing their names and making them into superstars and such. And, you know, I, I don't know that that necessarily is a cause of mass shooting events, but that's, you know, I think it's a fair conversation to have uh, with news media and, and maybe news media will want to rethink that more or less in the same way that news media has rethought you know, releasing the names of rape victims or suicide victims or things like that. Um, trying to encourage news media to stick to just the facts, even if those facts are fairly minimal. Um, that, that may be something that we can help news media do or, uh, you know, focus in on. Um, and I think in general, I think my point here is, is really to try to help be a resource for news media not to be full of crap. Um, I used some, some different initials there, but you can figure out what I meant there. But, but I think that, you know, from working with a lot of news media myself, I think for the most part, journalists really do want to be ethical and they really do want to be informative and they really do want to stick to the facts as best that they can. And they're looking for people to help them. So I think that we all know of kind of examples. We all know of journalists that don't do this, but I think the majority of them, if, if we, if we are rational human beings, when we speak to them, they will produce news reports that are a lot more rational and informative than may otherwise, um, you know, be the case. So I think that's what we can do as media psychologists to, to help journalists sort through and policymakers sort through some of these incredibly emotional reactions that we oftentimes do have uh, to these traumatic events. So anyway, that's my spiel. I hope that I haven't put you all to sleep um, with it. And uh, at this point, I'll be happy to take any questions um, that, that people have. Hopefully I was coherent. So what, what questions do people have? I think we're taking all of ourselves off of mute right now. So give everybody um, sure. just a second to uh, regroup. Okay. Do we have some questions for Chris or comments? I was just that good that no, nobody has anything to add to the. Uh, they're still all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just unmuted myself. It's Tanisha. Thank you, Chris. This was awesome. Sure. Yeah. And um, for everybody else in here, if you have a question too, um, that you can raise your hand um, next to your name. Um, we kind of go in order. Or if you're in a loud area, you can chat your question in there too, and we can read it. Um, but there was a couple of things that I wanted to ask you about during your presentation, um, especially that combo you said of like this being fascinating and disturbing because it really is kind of when mm -hmm. you think of that social construction like of news and how it kind of stirs this pot of moral panic mm -hmm. on like you know, a global and national level. And it's basically kind of, I think I get the sense that it's all for this kind of selfish monetary clickbait reason you know where it's just like going back to themselves and how people can get money yeah. you know like that analogy you said it's like there's a bunch of money on the ground and everybody going out to get it it's like but in the meantime all that money is basically covered in blood and mm -hmm. tears of the people that are actually being affected by said tragedy so yeah. at some point for me last maybe a year or so ago i cut the cable I was like, I'm done. I don't want to watch news anymore. I don't want, it's just polluting my mind. I don't want to deal with it anymore. So, because at some point I felt like enough was enough. And, you know, as media psychologists, we can understand how we can help journalists in this sort of way. But my question is, how can maybe an average consumer, someone who's not a psychologist, someone, you know, who might be a mother of four or whatnot, you know, and dealing with Sandy Hook or, you know, a yeah. parent kid who's sending their kid to college, how can, you know, an average consumer kind of filter news to discover what's credible from garbage yeah well that's that's a great question and I, I in fact i even get this question you know re referring to like scientific information how can you sort through scientific information that's you know crappy versus is, is good um and, and it's hard is is the reality uh, of it be, because um 
you know, a lot of the incentives out there are for the quick fix, you know, and that's true for journalism and it's true for politics and it's, and it's true for scientists. And so, as, as some of you are probably aware, we're having a whole conversation in psychological science about what's being called the replication crisis. And a lot of that has nothing to do with interesting topics from, to most of us. Um, uh, but there's still that sense of, you know, even in science, and, and by the way, this is nothing unique to psychology. I mean, obviously other fields are experiencing very much the same thing. Um, there's that sense of the quick headline is important and doing the hard work of replicating and making sure that that thing is true um, is, is, not really, is not very rewarding. So we haven't been very good about doing that uh, as such. So, but I mean, I, I think we have to understand that all of these things are reacting to incentives. Um, you know, so the news media is not evil. You know, they are not good or evil. I mean, something we think might think that they're evil, but they're, they're not evil. They're giving us what we are asking for, you know, and that is sensationalist headlines. And um, only when we stop tuning, I know this is something you, everybody hears, so the idea of tune, turn it off. I mean, you know, cut the cord, as you said, cut the cable. Um, if we stop rewarding particular types of narratives, um, then that's the only time things will, will change as consumers. So, uh, if you don't want to see, you know, politicians bashing the crap out of each other, don't tune into it, you know. So, um, Don, you know, Donald Trump's a great example. And I, I don't, again, not trying to be political for people that love him or hate him, but uh, he's, you know, he's, he's fascinating because he's, he's just so, you know, out there to some extent. And, but we're rewarding that the, he's getting coverage because we keep paying attention to it, uh, even though we may or may not think that he's a serious candidate. Uh, and such. So he's getting all that attention because, He's so fascinating to us, and, and we're, we're rewarding news media for covering him as opposed to everybody else that's in the Republican primary, um, you know, right now. And so I think you see a lot of that same thing. I mean, people tune in to watch people argue. They tune in to hear people speculate. Um, uh, um, people seem to be accepting of bad information in, 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 instead of no information. They seem to prefer bad information. And until we kind of, you know, change that incentive structure, I don't think things will change uh, necessarily. So, I mean, one of the things that did happen after Sandy Hook is, you know, you did have a few politicians like, uh, and I, I used to use the example of Jay Rockefeller, who called for a study of violent video games, and he made it very clear what he wanted the results of that study to be, and that he was going to use it to promote anti-game regulation um, legislation in Congress. And, uh, and he got criticized for that, rightfully so. Um, and, and so, I think that that reaction to him making that those kinds of comments actually kind of put the brakes on politicians sort of scapegoating video games after mass shooting. So there was the one that just happened in Oregon. I actually kind of watched that one kind of closely because the shooter was 26. So he's right in that age category where people are going to talk about video games. Um, I mean, and really people didn't, uh, you know, people and, you know, nobody mentioned video games for the most part um, and politicians didn't make any fuss over it. So, um, so it's possible that the sort of skeptical reaction to Jay Rockefeller may have put some of the breaks, may have changed the incentive for politicians to talk a lot about video games after matching. But but we'll see. I mean, I, you know, this has only been two years since then. So, you know, we'll see what future events bring. So did that, did that help or did that make, make any kind of sense? So, Chris, this is Barry Lynn. And uh, I do think that there, that you have something to be said about fact checking. And I wonder if that might actually um, have a, a much bigger um, effect here than um, you know, the profit part of it. And the idea that, um, that culturally we now are used to real-time information all of the time at yeah. our fingertips. And so um, news sources have the demand of the consumer put on them to constantly be giving the information and we do, they don't we don't have the luxury of waiting, and that wasn't much of a luxury at the time of waiting for. Well, the press doesn't go go to print till this time. The yeah. six o'clock news show doesn't start until six o'clock. Those kinds of things. So there was at least a little bit of time to seek some clarity and and do the fact checking, which doesn't seem to happen at the in the same way now because we we mm -hmm. want if something happened we want to know right away and so it's it's more of as it's unfolding and we're all a tad bit naive to it reporters or the people watching i wanted to bring out um 
a question that was asked in our Zoom chat, and it's from Daniel, and he asked comments. Seems talking of mentally ill mass shooters is rather um, tautological, defined by the usual behaviors after the fact, and not representative of the most mentally ill persons. Mm -hmm. Postman, how to be a crap detector, rough title as I remember, on the purpose of education. Mm -hmm. I was like, could you repeat that last part? There? I didn't, I didn't, you cut out just for a second there. I heard the, the crap detector part, but what was right before that? <laughs> no, postman, comma, how to be a crap detector, rough title as I remember, on the purpose okay. of education. So I think he's asking for comments as, as opposed to a specific question there. Oh, okay. How, how do you be a, a bullshit detector or sort of thing, uh, uh, if I'm understanding that, that, that correctly? Um, I mean, I, I, th I think that, you know, one of the things, you know, and of course I focus a lot on sort of the scientific aspects of things, um, but if, you, if you're thinking of like, like releases of scientific information, so what we have is, is uh, what I'm not a big fan of is a lot of scientific articles are now embargoed. Uh, so they're given to the journalists, um, but they can't say anything about them until a particular day and time. And then they all rush to sort of you know, release these reports um, and such. Um, and, you know, so how do you determine if what people are saying about science in, in, in uh, the news media is, is, is bullshit or bullcrap or whatever? Uh, I mean, a couple of things you can look for is um, counterintuitiveness, which so social science in general has had a big thing about counterintuitiveness. So the idea that you all thought X led to Y, but ha ha, we just did a study showing that X does not lead to Y or that X leads to Z. And sometimes, you know, sometimes counterintuitive things are true. Um, but they are, they're also very trendy and click baby. Um, and so what you want to be wary of is, is a counterintuitive finding being released and, and being reported as if it's factual, as opposed to, you know, this one study suggests this might happen. Um, and is it being expressed in dramatic terms? So the, the more conclusive people are being, the more extreme people are being, um, the more your bullshit detector ought to be um, you know, present. So there was like the Facebook study from a year or two ago. People were talking about, you know, the idea that Facebook was, you know, manipulating news feeds and making people depressed, which was not at all what the study showed. Um, but there was that kind of panic that, you know, got created as a response to that, this idea that in manipulating the news feeds of Facebook could cause this incredible emotional impact on people that were using Facebook. And of course it, it fed into this idea of like privacy and, and, and the people were not being informed that this was occurring and so on and so forth. But the, the actual effect size of that was so remote that it was the, like the, uh, that nobody would ever notice that, that type of impact in their, in, in, in their mood. So, so, I mean, I, I use the example of like, this was, this is ex the exact example that got me interested in doing video game research. When I, when I heard about scholars claiming that the effects of media violence on aggression were similar to smoking and lung cancer, that's an incredibly extreme claim. Even if there's an effect there to say it's that huge in, in magnitude is incredibly extreme. And, and that's the sort of thing ought to get, whatever the topic is, ought to get you saying, uh, uh-oh, you know, something's wrong here. Even if there's an effect there, people are exaggerating it. Um, kids today are doing X more than they ever have in the past. That's another kind of example of something that ought to you know, raise. One of the things I've, I've sort of talked about sometimes is the idea that there's a narcissism epidemic, you know, for instance. Um, you know, so look, looking for the, the word epidemic auto automatically, you know, key you in that, that this may be a problem, that there may be some BS in there, unless that word is followed by like, you know, or influenza or, or anthrax or something like that. We really shouldn't be using words like, like influenza. So, so looking for that kind of extreme language, uh, excuse me, words like uh, epidemic, um, looking for that kind of extreme language, looking for people that say that the evidence is completely on their side, um, that, you know, there's no doubt whatsoever that X causes Y, um, releasing these, inc these counterintuitive ideas that, sort of suggest you are all basically idiots to think that X causes Y. Look, we ran a study with 100 college students and proved that it doesn't. Um, those, those are the kind of things you want to look for probably as being, you know, bullshit detectors. Does that, that, that make sense or does that help? Yes. So, Chris, this is, this is Jerry Lynn again. Another thing that um, I particularly like uh, about uh, this that you, uh, Mary Gregerson has put together and the team that you're on, mm -hmm. and the idea of being able to talk to the news media, to the media that are on the site during these mm -hmm. 
various crises and the idea of being able to give them help and, and talking about the positive ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to put positive in the same sentence there, but the, uh, but a uh, careful uh, ways of being able to communicate this information out to the greater public um, to minis minimize hysteria yeah. and be able to um, proceed in, in a, as healthy way as possible um, yeah. after these kinds of crises. So, you know, with, with uh, my presidential initiative this year for Media Psychology and Technology for Good, I think this is um, a, a perfect example of that, where um, yeah. you can, bringing in the mental health professionals to help the media professionals as, as they're actually going through the experience and then um, conveying that information out to the public. So I really want to thank you for that because I think that that's a, um, a very positive initiative for, for coming out of Division 46. So that's excellent. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah something that I think that you, we just okay, have just a few minutes, and good. I just wanted to be mindful of that because we try to wrap up in the hour. Uh, so, just I do want you to comment, but maybe you can also then um, bring it to a full circle because this has been um, very intense, lots of information that you've provided for us today. So, thank you very much for that. Go no ahead. Problem. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, yeah, I was thinking of just to pick up on your previous comments there that, uh, you know, again, I think, you know, news media oftentimes are thinking of their audience who are mostly people that are, you know, just want to know what's going on about a, a situation. I think they sometimes forget like victims for victims families. And I, I was thinking of the example of the Malaysian Airlines uh, plane that, that, that went missing. And there are all these speculations about, you know, maybe the plane was hijacked and is now sitting somewhere in Central Asia. Uh, which was incredibly unrealistic, um, you know, supposition. That, I, don't, I don't know who made it, but, and, and I think that's probably a good example where media first responders can, if, if they're on scene, can, you know, talk to a journalist. And journalist said, like, you know, it could say, like, somebody just told me this as a speculation. And you might be able to say, like, you know, first off, what's the source? Do they have any actual, you know, evidence that this actually happened? And if you tell the families this, what emotional impact is that going to have on them? You know, that, uh, uh, because families are going to latch onto any ridiculous story as hope that their families, you know, that their loved ones are still alive. And, and sometimes you have to think about that kind of stuff is what impact is your news story going to have on the emotion, most emotionally vulnerable people um, that are responding to this crisis. And, uh, and, and I think we saw some of that with the Malaysian Airlines. Um, we saw that with the Ebola crisis where people that were, you know, medical first responders there were being, you know, uh, criticized for, you know, coming back to the country, you know, sometimes. Um, and then we saw after Sandy Hook with, you know, some of the various mental health or video game hypotheses that were going around that were you know, perhaps not as responsible as they could have been. Yeah. Sure. Hey, Chris, do, you, do we still have time for one more question? I know Tatiana raised her hand a few minutes ago and she's sure. Logged in all the way from Jordan, so I want to make sure she has a chance oh, to. Absolutely, yeah. I can I can hang out for a bit. I mean, I, I know other people probably have things to do, but I'm, I'm certainly willing to answer a few more questions. That's sure. Thank well, Tatiana, you. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Um, thank you very much. It's, this was an excellent presentation. I just have one question. Have, since the concept of moral panic emerged, have you noticed any change in the trends in media coverage of events? Some, I, I think, I, I think it has helped, and and um, it's it's funny. More panic as as a theory is discipline specific in the sense that criminologists know a lot about it because so many more panics are focusing on crime. So when you talk about moral panic theory to criminologists, they know what you're talking about. Um, it, it hasn't emerged as much into psychology, which I think is unfortunate because um, I think psychology in some cases has been responsible for promoting more panics. Um, but, I, but I think that has helped. So I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk about moral panic theory in conjunction with um, youth in general, uh, but video games specifically. And I, and I think in many ways that has helped our discussions of, of some of these things. So um, in some respects, I, I think that Sandy Hook really raised this issue of moral panic into a national consciousness. I think you know, people would talk about the conversation about video games as being a moral panic and the conversation about autism spectrum as being a moral panic um, and things like that. And so I, I, I think that that did change some of the incentive structures for politicians in particular and, and I think has made them more cautious. So in, in 2013, there was a shooting in September, the Naval Yard shooting in Washington, D.C., and it was interesting.
thing. The shooter was a little bit older, so he was in his 30s, about 36, if I remember correctly. Um, but it was interesting because at that point, it was only about nine months after Sandy Hook, the politicians that came out and talked about that shooting were very specific in saying video games are not on the table. We're not talking about video games. Even, even Rockefeller, you know, at that point said, you know, we don't really know anything about whether this guy played video games. So we're really not talking about video games. Um, and you know, it's, it's hard to make it, you know, a, a definitive causal connection there. But, but I think that some of that reaction to Sandy Hook and that sense of, we're being idiots, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're really just like, like talking about stuff we don't know what we're talking about. Um, I, I don't know if helps the right word, but I, but I think it raised some awareness that that kind of emotional conversation was not helpful and that we need to take our time and let the investigation pursue its course before we start talking about cause and effect. Um, we don't even know that the cause was in play uh, for a particular incident or shooter or whatever else we're talking about. So I, I think having a national conversation about moral panic does help because otherwise we, we know that these things happen. We can look back and look at the 80s when people talked about Sidney Lauper causing youth violence and you know, promiscuous sexuality and that kind of, and nobody thinks Sidney Lauper does this anymore. And I'm not even exactly, they, they, they focus in on Cindy Lauper and Ozzy Osbourne and, and Prince and, and bands like that. Um, we can look back and go, oh my God, I can't believe we did this. You know, this was stupid. Um, but we have trouble learning from that pattern unless we talk about it and refer back to these prior events, comic books, rock music, things like that. Um, because I think that, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, because I think the real tragedy is that if, we, if we're if we not aware about this pattern, then we really lose the opportunity to, to talk about things that really are important. Tatiana, did that answer your question? Or Yes, 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 very much so. Thank you. Well, yeah. I, I really want to thank you for doing this. Sounds like we might need to have um, a second webinar before the end of the year, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> we really definitely got the... Uh, a discussion going. Like I cool. said, it will be posted on um, our uh, our web. Uh, sorry, our YouTube channel uh, in the very near future. But we also uh, should use our listserv, our Division Forty Six listserv, to our advantage, and also go ahead and uh, continue to have conversation there as well. And thank you. I really appreciate you being here. I think uh, everybody else will um, join me in, in, in thanking you for taking some time out of your day to um, be here and to share your research and your thoughts on this. So thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. It's been a real pleasure and I appreciate that you invited me to be part of this. All right. Thanks everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye now.